the Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to CarryLutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. 1490 WGCH, this is Kerry Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network, which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold and silver for over 20 years, and I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. For more information, find them on the web at milesfranklin.com or give them a call at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. It's time for another Triple Lutz Report. If you've been listening to the show for any length of time, you know that I love stories about government incompetence, government corruption, and fraud, because they just illustrate the futility of our financial system, and they show how ineffective and corrupt government is and it was a great story a woman stole 53 million dollars from dixon illinois the controller over a period of about 20 years and this was ronald reagan's birth town so rita crunwell 59 she was controller of dixon illinois since 1983 stole 53 million she used it to buy three homes, more than a dozen cars, trucks, and other vehicles, and to invest in a horse farm that has over 311 quarter horses. It's just amazing. From 2006 to 2012, six-year period, she stole $30 million, five million bucks a year. Like, is anybody watching the store? It's only a city of about 15,000 people. It's 100 miles away from chicago but when it comes to illinois every dollar that the public puts out in the form of taxes that the government collects is subject to theft without notice this is illinois this is what happens they might be in worse condition than many other states in the country but it's no different than what happens in your town and what happens in my town this is the way that it works And right now, prosecutors want to seize her residences and the horse farm. It's got a place in Florida, of course. She has a $2.1 million luxury motorhome and a 1967 Corvette. So anyone who says that it doesn't pay to work for the government isn't being very honest with you. This is the way it works. And Going through the news, I'm looking at today's international forecaster that Bob Chapman so graciously produces twice a week. Who would think, talk about contrarian indicators in Manhattan, New York City, the Big Apple, place where I am found frequently because the restaurants are great, good plays. My kids happen to live there. I couldn't talk them out of it. Right now, multifamily buildings in Manhattan, there's a panic going on there. They can't buy them fast enough. The capitalization rate, meaning your return on funds invested, is 4.4%, which is extremely low. And rents are increasing. Everything is fine and dandy. And at the same time, Illinois, that wonderful state that we just discussed, their pile of unpaid bills is growing by about 30% this year. Their pension plans are the most unfunded in the country, and they're trying to issue $1.8 billion worth of debt so that they can manage this situation. And the fact of the matter is that you don't solve problems with debt by issuing more debt. It won't work for the United States. It won't work for Illinois. It won't work for New York City. It won't work for California. Any place you can think of. We've got a paper coming out called The Golden Era of Municipal Bankruptcy. That's what's going to happen in the United States. So don't worry. Be happy. It's all going to be decided by your local bankruptcy judge. And there was a story that I wanted to cover 
couple of weeks ago, and that is that Apple is using subsidiaries in Ireland and the Netherlands and other low tax nations as part of a strategy to cut its global tax bill. And the New York Times, of course, is outraged by this because the New York Times doesn't know what a profit is. They've been losing money since I can remember, losing market share, and they don't know how to make money. So, of course, when they see a company like Apple making billions of dollars and not paying taxes, they're outraged. Well, let me tell you something, New York Times. Try becoming profitable again, and let's see what you do to minimize your tax burden. I guarantee you, you'll be doing the same thing as Apple if you can. And what Apple does, for instance, they're based in California. They set up a small office in Reno, Nevada to collect and invest its profits. And the last time I heard, this kind of thing is legal because in Nevada, the corporate tax rate is zero. In Cali, for you people uh, who don't like being called that, California, the tax rate's 8.84%. So why wouldn't you set up a subsidiary in Reno to, to reinvest your profits tax-free? It seems like a totally reasonable form of behavior to me. We're all human. Even corporations are composed of humans. We want to minimize our tax bite legally to the best of our ability. We want to control how we recognize income and if possible, where we recognize it, so that we'll pay the least amount of tax possible. Corporations are better able to do this because they can open up offices and subsidiaries in any place in the world. When you download a song off of iTunes, do you care if that corporation is located in Cupertino, California, next to Apple's headquarters? Or perhaps it could be located in Hong Kong and the income goes to Hong Kong, or maybe it's in Switzerland and the proceeds get reinvested into gold. Who cares? This is what corporations have always done. They've been doing it since I can remember. The system is designed to allow them to do it. And New York Times, what about GE? GE pays virtually nothing in taxes. And the last I heard, I think they were headquartered in Connecticut. And I'm in favor of that. I don't think corporations should be paying any taxes because eventually when you charge corporations taxes, the consumer pays for it. The company doesn't pay the taxes. The consumer, their customers pay those taxes. And look at a company like GE, huge, huge multinational corporation. They've got skyscrapers full of lawyers and accountants figuring out how they can avoid paying any taxes whatsoever. They do pay some taxes. I don't know how much income tax they pay, but it's de minimis compared to the profits that they're racking in. A lot of them because of crony capitalism, because of the U.S. government, because of phony green energy scams and all that. But a lot of them are real, like when you take off in an airplane and that engine that provides the thrust was built by GE. Or when you open that refrigerator to pop out some ice from the ice maker, or you turn on your dishwasher and it cleans your dishes. You know, they have competition now like they've never had before, but they still make a lot of products that are real. On the other hand, there's a lot of their company that is really just tangled up in crony capitalism and doesn't really produce a lot of value. Interestingly, 71 technology companies make up the S&P 500, Apple, Google, Yahoo, Dell, and they reported paying global cash taxes over the past two years at a rate that's on average at a rate that is on average one third less than the other S&P 500 companies. And I'm disappointed in them. I really am because I'm sure the other two thirds of the S&P is paying a low tax rate, but I would have thought they could get their accountants and their lawyers in there 
and they'd be paying two thirds less. So if you're a shareholder in one of these companies, you have a right to be upset because they are not adequately minimizing their tax burden. And it's costing you in terms of potential dividends and their stock price, because the more they pay in taxes, the less profitable they are, the lower their stock price is going to be. No question about it. This is what happens. And finally, this is the top story. I probably should have opened with it. Kevin Warsh was a Fed governor. You know, he's one of those guys that sits on the board with, I guess, the likes of Greenspan and the Ben Bernanke and figures out how to transfer your wealth, take the money out of your pocket and put it into the bankster's pockets. That's their job. That's why they were created. And that's their purpose for being the Fed. And last week, he said that government backing that continues to support the largest banks, the zombie banks, are just really destructive and bad. He said, and I quote, we cannot have a durable, competitive, dynamic banking system that facilitates economic growth if policy protects the franchises of oligopolies atop the financial sector. And he told an audience at Stanford Law School that those interconnected firms that find themselves dependent on implicit government support do not serve our economy's interest. I would go one further, Mr. Warsh. I would say that they are stealing from all of us. They are making all of us poorer. They're destroying the country. They're destroying our means of economic sustenance and support and they need to be blown up immediately and blown up in the figurative sense of the word they need to be broken up disbanded and all guarantees removed you know one of the things that glass steagall did and everybody is always oh we need to go back to glass steagall to separate investment banking from commercial banking gambling banking from saving money and making loans and i agree with that but Glass-Steagall also created the FDIC. And prior to federal deposit insurance, people actually had to care about the loans that their banks made. And they had to have confidence that the bankers running their local bank, remember Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life, that wasn't technically a bank. It was a savings and loan, but most people don't know the difference now anyway. But you counted on Jimmy Stewart to do the right thing. And when Jimmy Stewart screwed up, Jimmy's bank went bankrupt and people wanted to lynch him. He had to leave town because you were so upset that you lost your life savings that you went after him. And now with federal deposit insurance up to 250000 and in certain instances unlimited, You don't have to care about your bank because you know that the government is not going to let your bank fail. So get rid of public deposit insurance. Require banks or allow banks to go and purchase private insurance because private insurance companies will not underwrite insurance to insolvent banks. So Warsh doesn't believe that these huge oligopolistic zombie bank should be broken up. He says that their disclosures must be subject to new and ramped up transparency requirements so investors can differentiate strength from weakness. The policy has favored large global banks and disfavored small and medium sized banks. Now he's got a point here, but if there was transparency, if you knew how bad these banks were and their true derivative exposure, There'd be a run on these banks tomorrow, they would be shuttered, and they'd be gone. So yes, Mr. Warsh, we don't have to specifically go break them up, but if we do what you're saying, there will be runs on these banks, there will be panics, it will bring the world financial system down faster than it's going now, if you could believe such a thing. So no, the government must seek to break up these banks, decontrol the banking sector, Don't allow them free loans at the discount window, which is just propping up the failed system. Outlaw all derivatives that have no basis in actual physical reality, meaning 
Don't allow people to use derivatives to bet against one another, to bet against countries, to bet against banks. Shutter it. Okay, That's how these big banks are sustaining themselves. This is what's going to bring them down. Not that they're going to pay the money, but what will bring them down is when big countries like Spain and Italy collapse and they can't afford to honor their derivatives. So you need to look at this. All of this is abstract seems not to make any difference to your life or mine but nothing could be further from the truth all of these things are conspiring to bring the system down if you're not prepared for it if you're not ready you're going to go down with it even if you are prepared and ready you might go down with it as well i might go down with it i wouldn't say i'm fully prepared myself however at least you might have a fighting chance and that leads me to the next item Go over to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. If you haven't done it already, sign up for the Financial Survival Toolkit. It's free. It's not going to cost you a cent. You'll also get our weekly newsletter, free, F-R-E-E. Get it. What are you waiting for? There's no obligation here. If there's information in there that you like, take it. What you don't like, leave. But just go over to the site. Sign up now. I'm doing this because I want you to be prepared. On that note, it's Kerry Lutz, been another Triple Lutz Report, signing off. <laughs>